I'm Drew Dumsch. I'm the president and CEO of the Ecology School and also one of the co-founders. We started the Ecology School as a residential environmental learning center back in 1998. Back in May of 2015, um, Riverbend Farm came on the market and I dropped my daughter, my younger daughter, um, off at ballet class and drove to the driveway at, right at the beginning. And even from there, looking down the Riverbend Farm driveway toward the barn, I was like, oh my gosh, if it's half as beautiful, it's just the driveway, I think we'd be interested. We knew that the science of ecology, which is really the science of making connections, making connections between the environment, making connections between humans and the environment, um, that's been kind of the foundational aspect of our curriculum for years. But really we've evolved over the years that sustainability is really applied ecology. The International Living Future Institute uh, out in Seattle, their living building uh, challenge really was exactly what we wanted to pursue. That uh, the idea of this uh, flower in the field, uh, giving back to the environment and giving nectar to the bees and being beautiful and holding down the soil. Jesse Thompson at Kaplan Thompson Architects, who's our lead architect for the project said, you know, there's a, a bigger certification called Living Community Challenge. It's how are you connected into your uh, neighborhood and your, your city. And reading what the Living Community Challenge certification was going to require, it was basically a laundry list of what the Ecology School wanted to do at Riverbend Farm anyway. I'm happy to say this past spring, uh, spring of uh, 2020, um, we were notified that our Living Community Challenge Master Plan and Vision Statement was the first approved master plan for Living Community Challenge in the world. To build a dining commons and a dorm, everything has to be vetted for environmental impacts. It's where we need to head. We need to not build buildings that have an impact on the environment, whether it's vinyl siding, the, the manufacture of it um, can cause cancer or issues of, of social justice and equity. These all matter to green building and development. Hi, my name is Danielle Foisy. I'm a project designer at Kaplan Thompson Architects, and my role in the Ecology School was mainly facilitating the Living Building and Living Community Challenge certification. I'm Todd Richardson. I'm principal of Richardson Associates. We're landscape architects, and as landscape architects, our role in the project was to be involved in siting the buildings and developing the, the landscape for the project. My name is Adam Ruthier and I'm the project manager for Zachow Construction on the Ecology School project. What made me excited to join the Ecology School project was definitely the client, seeing how passionate they were about environmental sustainability and pushing green building standards made it a really exciting project to be a part of. So when initial conversations emerged, just knowing about the Ecology School and having an opportunity to participate in helping them define their future here uh, was terrific. Personally, I was very interested in the project. I grew up on a small farm and have since taken over and now own and manage the farm. And I think the natural symbiotic relationship uh, is something that, that small scale farming understands that aligns with LBC and, and what Ecology School is trying to achieve. My advice to anyone looking to pursue LVC or LCC is to assemble a team of experts in the field. So in the Ecology School, we had a really great multidisciplinary team of civil, landscape, electrical, architecture. Everyone was very involved in meeting the requirements for LVC. And another thing to keep in mind is to be flexible, especially with the materials palette. You might not be able to use what you had originally intended. For example, we really wanted to use FSC white cedar. We could not find a source for it anywhere. So we went with FSC white pine, still a beautiful local product, but we had to pivot along the way. 
So the living building challenge has, has very far-reaching impacts on the on the building side, the construction side. It means that all of these really toxic and harmful chemicals that we use everywhere, any sort of liquid, any sort of sealant, glue, adhesive, solvent, um, it means that we are not bringing those home on our skin or in our clothes. Um, and as someone who has a, a recently turned one-year-old, uh, that is really meaningful to us. You know, we, we don't want to bring some of these chemicals and some of these harmful things home with us. Uh, on the manufacturing side, that also means that these companies aren't producing as much of these really harmful chemicals that, that pollute local communities. Um, and concurrently, it means that we're creating a supply demand chain for the companies that create better options. There was always a goal that the team had to make sure that the way in which the campus was developed was really site inspired and site responsive. And if you look at the way in which the dormitory, which is a fairly linear building, it's not a straight building, but it's a linear building overall, comprised of three components that those are nestled fairly closely to a significant row of trees that exist uh, back there. And then the commons building, which is more of a, a public building by its uses, is forward in the site in a way that captures that terrific view of the river and the bend in the river uh, for which this property is, is known. One of my favorite aspects of living building challenge requirements is the biophilic design charrette, which is intentionally incorporating feature what you love about nature into the built environment to make it less sterile places to be. And so in the ecology school, we had a full day charrette with um, educators, the ecology school, the architecture team, civil team, landscape, etc. And we all got together and thought about how can we intentionally incorporate dappled lighting and curiosity enticement and mystery into the design. And so as you walk through the ecology school, you'll start to see some of those features that we thought of that day pop up. For example, in the commons, in, if you're underneath the porch roof, there's cutouts. Um, which solar panels are going on top of, and that will hopefully create a cool lighting effect and also highlight some of the sustainable features of the building. So specifically with this project, that collaborative approach was was essential uh, because everyone was working from a, um, a place of uh, a lack of experience. No, none of us, from the architects to any of the builders, had ever done a living building challenge project before. And they call it a challenge because they don't even know how to do the whole process. You, it is a challenge because you have to figure it out. Uh, and that does not work if you don't have these collaborative relationships in place. So that really allowed us to work as a team to figure things out as they came into our plates and as we identified things and challenges products we could or couldn't use and had to readapt uh, and, and kind of transition through the project that way. I'm Jesse Thompson from Kaplan Thompson Architects and we were the lead architects on the project. My name is Ryan Cantaris. I'm a principal at Scott Simons Architects and a project architect and design lead for the Design Commons building at the Ecology School project at Riverbend Farm. I'm Chris Briley. I'm a principal here at Bryburn. Uh, we were the design lead for the dormitory building for the Ecology School. We were also the uh, energy modelers for uh, the uh, entire project. When they described the project, it sounded really, really complex and difficult, and we're suckers for complex and difficult. The team that's now involved with it was actually all invited to participate in what we thought was essentially an interview process. So it was a unique procurement process. We all thought we were going to, to learn about the acquisition of the farm and learn about the school and their programs in order to be able to help them with their design. And in the end, the decision was made by Drew Dench, the executive director of the ecology school, to actually bring us all on board as a collaborative ecology of the team. It was done with a very intentional approach to bring a variety of different perspectives and uh, dispositions towards the project and actually hopefully end up with a product that was a greater whole than the sum of its parts. 
we architects, we've got big egos, you know, we have to, you know, put all of that aside and just work from a very humble standpoint where the project comes first and the client comes first. And, um, you know, if there were three firms that could possibly do this, it would be these three firms. Like Jesse, before starting his own firm, worked here for seven years or so. And Chris Briley at Bryburn, his partner worked here for six or seven years. These firms have a deep interconnection that allowed us to work well and understand our different approaches. The process of working with a large group like this has been that you, you just really learn to communicate better because you you don't all the shortcuts you have when you're just sitting in a room with someone working with them. You have to be more explicit and take good notes and write things down and actually really listen to other people. Um, you can't rely on the shortcuts you usually do. Uh, it was really, you know, check your ego at the door, come together, work, and it was a lot of uh, pinning up of uh, designs and reviewing them together. And I think it really made the project better by having all these different brains and points of view and design talent all in one product. I think it's going to be really interesting to see the ecology school evolve over time and be able to see how the kids actually use the place. Uh, because when you're designing, you're, you're guessing on what the future is going to be and you're trying to predict how are people going to move through a beautiful landscape like this? How are they going to use the paths that you've laid out? How are they going to work with the buildings? Uh, and all those things I think are going to be really fascinating to watch, uh, both the energy use of the project to where people choose to sit and how things like the rain on the skylight sound. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to hear all that evolve over time. Make as much energy, uh, even make even more energy than they use or uh, you know, have even more water than they, than they waste and to grow a lot of the food right on site that the kids are going to consume. I mean, I think as more kids go through that um, school uh, process, they're going to take that back into their own communities. I think they're going to kind of affect the whole education system or like at least encourage that that uh, environmental stewardship and leadership. There, There's also a, a real uh, moment I think happening in the state of Maine right now where the capacity to develop and, and deliver incredibly high performance and sustainable projects in, is really, um, it, it outclasses what would be expected of a small design community in a state of this size. There's a real depth of expertise and commitment that is visible in the projects being taken on by main designers. Every credit goes to the Ecology School for making this a decision that they've held true to and a decision that they've made happen. Instead of having one architectural firm that now is a specialist in Living Building Challenge, uh, there's now three in the state of Maine that are really good and spreading the gospel, if you will, about the Living Building Challenge in that process. So